So I know that we're jumping around a little bit, but these sections, I don't like the way the book's organized in chapter uh, four. So we're going my way. Did you organize the homework how you wanted it to be? The, it's a little weird how it Yeah, the dates, it should go chronologically with the way I'm lecturing. Okay. Did I put mean value? Well, I'll go look again, but. I'm pretty sure mean, the number two, 4.2, is after 4.7. Okay, good. So we're going to do. So the name of this chapter is, or section is, extreme values of functions. So they have to do with local mins, local maxes. Uh, but there's a little bit more to extreme values. So extreme values. like 4.2 is right after 4.1. Okay, no problem. So we'll go extreme values of uh, f of x on on an interval. We'll call the interval capital I. Are the largest and smallest Y values obtained the interval. So extreme values are talking about Y values, the biggest, smallest Y value. So in the book, there's the extreme value theorem. Says if your function is continuous and your interval is closed, you get a max and a min. So if f is continuous and interval i is closed, then f obtains a maximum and a minimum value. Is, when you say outliers in statistics, usually that's a discrete set where like a lot of things are clustered in one area and then there's a couple that are not. So that's not a good way to describe continuous functions because they're all connected with, uh, they are, if you just look at y values, they're the largest, smallest y value. Now there can be more than one place that you have a maximum y value. It's not really part of the theorem, separate. Uh, global in the sense of on the entire interval I. Okay. So maximum minimum may be obtained at multiple x values. So what are some really fast sketches of what could be happening? Uh, here, maybe your function looks like a parabola. And there's your interval right there. So you get one minimum right in the middle. And you actually could get two maximums, one at each edge right there. Uh, another thing that can happen. You could get that your 
you get a local max and a local min, and they're both the ab absolute max and the absolute min. So locals could be the extreme value. Or it could be that basically endpoints could be the extreme value. So those are generally the two cases that can happen. So local max and min may be global max or min, depending on how your function looks. Not always true. Uh, the other options are the endpoints. So I talked about closed intervals in that theorem. Uh, if your function is continuous and your interval is closed, you get a max and a min. So what happens if you're not closed? Wait, what's your question again? Um, in between the interval, how do you test? So like, um, one of the questions was 4 and 10, they gave you a function. So it's in between 4 and 10 in that area, and then you had to do like 3 so and 7. And so I'll show you how to test them. Okay. So basically, I gave you the outline right here. <coughs> it could be the... Uh, critical points could be candidates. The other ones that are potential candidates are your endpoints. Okay. So that's that's the procedure to test. Oh, so if one of your critical points was to be like a maximum was to be lower than your your the end of your interval that you were given, your one closest to it would actually be your maximum. Yeah, or I'm just going to write out the candidates to test, and you just find all the y values, and the biggest is the biggest, the smallest is the smallest. So this is if f is diffable, which of course we know that implies continuous. So we saw that differentiable implies continuous. And i is closed. So if f, f is differentiable and i is closed, you're going to find critical points and endpoints. Now, make sure your critical points are on i. If you have critical points that are outside i, you don't count those. You just want to make your, your critical points in i. And you just look for the largest and smallest y values. That's all you have to do if I give you a continuous function on a closed interval. So we're going to use this procedure right here. So go ahead and find the critical value or values. Make sure that you throw away ones that are outside the interval. So do critical points first, end point second.
So we got lucky on this problem. One of the endpoints is also a critical point. So I didn't have to recheck the y value on the negative one, even though it was an endpoint and a critical point. So endpoints in the interval, negative one, x is negative one, x is positive three. x is negative one is already a critical value as well, or a critical point. So I only had to look for three y values to get biggest and smallest. Easy question, what's the biggest y value? 18. So this is what we call the maximum or global maximum. Global. What is the smallest y value? Negative 2. Negative 2. So negative 1 comma 2 is a local how do we know if it's a local max or a local min? Can't really tell from this. We could graph it, but what do we need to do to graph it? I need second derivative and get concavity. So if I knew it was happy or sad, I could say it was a local max or min. So let's go ahead and figure that out. So I want to classify this one. I already know it's not a global max or min, because I found a bigger and a smaller y value. So it's definitely not the winner in those categories. So we're going to classify the critical point. So I need f double prime. So I'm taking another derivative, which is 6x. Make sure you plug in the x value, not the y value. So we get negative 6, less than 0, frowny face. But that means local maximum. So that theorem says that we're done right here. I don't need to check anything else. So I don't have to go, well, what about 0? Zero is in the interval, yes, but zero is not a critical point. What about positive two? It's in the interval, but I don't have to check it. I don't check any other number of the infinite numbers in the interval. And that's the intermediate value theorem? That is the extreme value theorem somewhere. Extreme value theorem. So you only have to check very few things, critical points and endpoints, as long as you have a continuous function on a closed interval. So now you're thinking, what if the function is not continuous, or what if my interval is not closed? And we'll look at that. Is there another question? What if it's linear? If our function is linear? Yeah. Oh, it's pretty easy then. Any uh, critical points on linear function? No. Unless you're horizontal, and then every point is critical. So let's look at a linear function real quick. If it's a closed inner, well, first of all, is your linear function continuous? Yes. So if you have a closed interval, there is a local ma uh, absolute max and min. If you don't have a closed interval, it goes forever. So that's one of the problems of a non-closed interval is you have the opportunity to go forever, depending on your end behavior. So that's a good question. Uh, linear functions don't have critical points overall. So that, that part of checking is out. So it really comes down to, in the extreme value theorem, if you're over a closed interval or not. So you're a closed interval, you definitely have max and min. So now we'll get into the tricky part of what about extreme on open intervals. So what about this interval right here from 1 to 3 of this function that I just made up? What is the global max? 
Is there well one of the three are x values? So I want y values to be the max or the min. Is there any maximum y value? Remember, we're talking ex extreme values are y values, not x values. Maybe. So whatever number I pick, positive number, I can go past it. So we'd say on this example, there would be no global maximum. What about minimum, negative y values? Same problem, no global minimum. On this one, they, uh, you can call them that, yes. Uh, I hesitate a little bit because you don't know what's going on outside of that, so there's sort of local max and min by default. Right. Because you can't, and at least from this graph, I don't know what happens outside of those values. <coughs> so in this graph, they would be, this would be a local minimum right there and this one would be a local max but definitely not global for the whole function so there's one thing that can happen and we'll do so you really have to graph the function and have some knowledge about the what the function looks like to answer if you can't use the extreme value theorem that makes the problem possible if you don't have this you really need to know what the graph looks like before you can answer so we'll do one more example. So I'm going to keep the function easy so that you can graph it in a couple seconds. And then I want you to answer the question, what are the glo local and global max and min? So our function, we'll just go with x squared on the interval negative 1 to infinity. So your function is super easy. Unfortunately, you can't use the extreme value theorem because you do not have a closed interval. So don't bother looking at the extreme value theorem. Well, you could look at it, but you're not guaranteed to get what it says. So graph this function from negative 1 to infinity, and then figure out what is the absolute max, absolute min, and any local max and mins that you have. There can be more than one local max and local min. So just be aware of that. There can be more than one global max and global min as well, yeah. Like think of the sine function has lots of maximums. It hits one an infinite number of times. Well, when you graph it out, you're going to be probably looking for all four at the same time. And very frequently they are, the, the extreme value theorem says some, they can be the same. So graphing this function should take two seconds or so, and then answer these questions.
global maximum. Is it open door closer? Oh, uh, it's neither. On the left side is includes negative one, but on the right side does not include negative uh, positive infinity. So it's neither open nor closed. But because it's not closed, you can't use the extreme value theorem. All right, is there a maximum? Nope, whatever number you say, we'll go past that. So none. What about global minimum, smallest y value? Yep, so zero, zero for red as a point. And local maximum. No. Does the global min need to be a point, or is it just the y value? Uh, I like to write them as points. Uh, so there's really, you could say that this is a local max right here. There's nothing else close by it that's bigger, but it doesn't have the, it's not a critical value or a critical point. So I'm going to write it in here. And local min, zero, zero. So zero, zero, one in two categories. It's a local and absolute. So it's the lowest one around. Now, of course, you can have weird functions that go something like that. You might have two local maximums, two local minimums. Um, and actually, if this function doesn't keep going up, you could have two global maximums as well. So don't assume that there's always going to be one. Sometimes there's none. Sometimes there is lots. So it all depends on what your function looks like. So that's about all there is to extreme values. Find critical points, look at endpoints, compare the y values. Things are tricky if your interval is open, though. So if your interval's open, you have to know about the function. What's happening over there? And just because your interval's open, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a global max. You could have a function called the bump function, which is kind of boring, but it looks like this. And it goes forever, both sides. Is that this downward or is that flat? No, it's supposed to be flat. Okay. Y equals zero, or whatever number you want. This has a global maximum, even though it goes forever horizontally in both directions. So this one have a global max, no global min at all. I think e the minus x squared, I think, is an example. Yeah, I think mean, that would be an example. It's probably not the best bump function, but it'll work. So when x is 0, you have 1 over e to the 0, which is 1. So you'd have a height 1 right there. And then when x is maybe 2, that squares out to 4. So you'd have 1 over e to the 4th, which is smaller than 1. And then when x is huge, you're getting very close to 1 over a huge number. I don't want to call this a bump function. There's probably a better example of a bump function, but that's just one example of a function that looks like that. Oh, we haven't seen e to the x, so don't worry about that either. So where to next? We're graphing stream values. We're going to go optimization. Wait, the homework says mean value theorem next, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll sort out the due dates a little bit, a little bit better. Let's do applied optimization first. So applied optimization is basically solving word problems. So it's going to feel a lot like related rates, your favorite section. 
the difference is uh, there's going to be a keyword. So related rates, generally, they ask how fast is something happening. Uh, it, they're asking about a rate, something that's changing over time. It's generally how fast, how slow. I don't know. There's probably some other words in there that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Applied optimization, you want to uh, optimize. You want to maximize or minimize, depending on what's, what you're trying to do. So we want to find a local minimum or maximum of a function to find the best solution. So we want to find a local max or a min. of a function to find the best solution. So we'll write out the steps right here. So step one, we better get a function. So create an equation. And a lot of times a picture can help. Step two, this is optional. Solve for the variable to be optimized. And for convenience, let's say it is V. We're just using V for variable. So we want to optimize v. So step three, take derivative. So I'm going to write d over dx, except it won't always be x. Yeah, I'm just putting a letter in there to because we take a lot of x derivatives. You generally won't take a t derivative here. So if you're taking a t derivative, you're either optimizing wrong or you are doing a related rates when you should be optimizing. So there shouldn't be any t derivatives here. Because you're not looking for how long it took, you're looking for how much of it or whatever. Yeah, because that would tell you how things are changing over time. Right. And I want to know how things are changing. You'll see the types of problems, but you're going to get to choose maybe how long to make one side to maximize area, something like that. Next is the variable. And the variable you are optimizing with respect to, that sounds horrible, are optimizing to, generally, x is the independent variable. So that would be derivative of the calculus step. Then, of course, set it equal to 0. Well, solve for dv dx, and then set it equal to 0. To get x values.
Now there may be more than one x value, use the one that makes sense. Yeah, a lot of times you'll throw out the negative, or if it's not supposed to be bigger than five feet and one optimization is 20 feet, you're like, ah, oh, it's too big, I can't, okay. can't make it 20 feet. And then step five, plug back in the original equation. So plug this x value. So this original equation is what you got from number one before you did any derivatives. So plug it into the original equation before you took the derivative. So x of f prime equals zero into f of x. Whatever x value made that f prime zero. So we're going to do really three examples, two of, the, two of them will be very similar. So the good news is this doesn't require a whole paragraph of writing. So design a one liter can shaped like a right cylinder. What dimensions use the least material? So this is question one, what dimensions So before we start drawing a can or a cylinder, how do we know this is optimization problem? And I know it because it's in the section called optimization. But on your final exam, the problem probably won't say this is from the optimization section. So how do you know this is not related rates? What dimension is used the least material? So what word in there? Least. least. So you're going to get a superlative. So least, most. You may actually see max or min, but generally it's going to be least, most, most expensive, cheapest, something like that. So least material, that means optimize. We're not asking about uh, things changing. So we're saying what uses the least material. All right. Right cylinder, that's easy to draw. So there's a can right there. So we got a cylinder can. Now I didn't talk about how do we get the material it takes to make this can. Basically, surface area. So we're going to get the surface area of this shape right here. So I wrote amount of material equals surface area. It's really it's going to be a multiple of the surface area, depending on how thick you make it and what units you use, but mathematically is proportional to surface area. So if I minimize surface area, I will minimize the amount of material. So I'm just going to write equals. Since we have a liter, which is area, do we have to convert area to surface area? Liter is not area. Liter is volume. volume. So we, well, well, let's worry about that in a minute. We're just on surface area right now. All right, how do I get surface area of this shape? So we need a radius, we need a height right here. So I'm going to go A for the area. So what is some part of the area? That was probably a part of it. Pi H. So 
let's get the pi h. And we also have to do the circumference right here. So we'll rewrite this a little bit. So our circumference and CE circumference times height plus two lids. So we get whatever circumference is times the height. So if you cut the label off and you rolled it out, one of the dimensions is the height and the other one is the circumference. So we get circumference times h plus two lids. What is the circumference? Pi r. Almost. Two pi r. Two pi r. So two pi r times the h that was right there. Plus, what's the area of a lid? That's the pi r squared. So we have area related to two other variables. So we have, unfortunately, three variables in the mix. You really need to get down to two variables here. What information have I not used? One liter. And how does that relate to the shape we drew? So our volume. Height times base area. So our volume. Now our volume, is that changing or not changing? Not changing. Not changing. So I'm using a 1 for volume, not a V. Our volume is not changing. It would be height times weight, right? Height, so we could write it as height times uh, base area. So the area of the base. Uh, going up through the height is one way to think about the volume. So we got h pi r squared is 1. Is it easier to solve? So let's look in our original. I think if we took out, if we took out the h, that might be easiest. So we'll solve our equation down here for h, and then plug that in. So I'm going to solve. for h, and then I'm going to put that in where I see h up there. So divide, so h is 1 over pi r squared. So I'm going to take that value and plug it in where I see h. You need an r there. I sure do. All right, plus, let's clean this up a tiny bit. So pi's cancel, we have, is that just 2 over r plus 2 pi r squared? All right, so we got the area related to just the radius now. So looking at those steps, we have create an equation, and we're relating the independent variable, the one we're going to choose. So we're going to choose the radius, and that's going to dictate the height. So if we make a really big radius, we're going to have a really short can. If we choose a really small radius, we'll have a really tall can. And choose a medium one, et cetera, et cetera. So picking the radius is going to determine the height. And I can tell right now, if the radius is negative, that's bad. So any negative radius or zero radius, that's not going to work for our manufacturing facility. So we're going to have to keep a radius positive. So if I get a negative radius, that's out right there. All right, derivative. So I'm taking a derivative, d, d what? R. So that is correct, 2 pi r. So I said in the procedure, we're taking derivative with respect to the independent variable, the one that we are able to choose. So we pick an r, that's going to determine pretty much everything else. So our independent variable is r. I could have eliminated r's and gotten h's, in which case I'd be picking h and then getting r from that. So I'd be picking a height, getting a radius. Um, so like on a, a soda can or something like that, the top and bottom are typically thicker than the walls. Um, 
That's an engineering problem. Would you have, it would be just related rates on top of this, right? Uh, if you knew how much thicker they were, you could, like, if you knew they were three times thicker, you could do like that right there. Okay. Like, weight that. Cost per cubic inch or square inch or whatever. Yeah, so we're assuming all the material is the same, everything. We're just doing surface area. So we're c making our can with a uniform material, the same amount all over. If you want to combine this with related rates, I bet you could make a special quiz just for you. <laughs> you, you can cer certainly, in real world, things are way more complicated than this. There's probably other issues, like I maybe making the lid is cheaper than the size or vice versa. So it's just not just the material, but making it, making a side might be very easy compared to a lid, things like that. So you might, you, maybe you want bigger sides and smaller lids or vice versa. So that, all those things depend. All right, so we're taking a R derivative. So go ahead, use your calculus skills. I'll do the left side. You do the right side. Thank you. Oh yeah, pretty helpful. You don't necessarily need quotient rule, but it might be good to go for it. I don't recommend skipping quotient rule unless you've done hundreds or thousands of quotient rules before like I have. Yeah, oh, I really did the two over R. It was like that right there. Two times R to the negative first power, multiply, becomes negative, and power decreases to negative two. All right, what is the next step? What's the next step? Solve for R. Solve for R. So it's a derivative. So, so it says solve for dv dx, but what does that mean here? DADR. DADR. So we've already solved for DADR. I want to minimize. I want to minimize the area with respect to the radius. So this derivative, I want to equal zero. So we need to find the critical points that are minimal. Yep, that's exactly right. So we're setting zero equal to DADR. This is not a time for your algebra skills to fail you. It's done a lot of work so far. Drawn a picture, used geometry, calculus, it's pretty much just algebra, and then we're done. How do I solve for R? Do fractions suck? Yes. Yeah, so how do we get out of fraction land? Multiply by what? R squared. So let's multiply by R squared. Eh, it doesn't matter. So factor out a two, and then we have our nice zero product property right here. Two is not zero, so the second one equals zero. So subtract. It's probably overkill. I didn't need to do all this. R cubed, negative one over two pi. So regular R.
Hold on, something's wrong. Oh. That should be a minus one. Minus one. Yeah, you should not be getting a negative R. Something is wrong if your R is negative. Yeah, so I had my sign flipped. So R is the cube root of 1 over 2 pi. If you have a calculator, you could compute this out. Now, I didn't give you any units anyways, so computing this out, if you don't know if you're in inches or centimeters or maybe you're making big, huge cans in feet or yards or something like that. So if you don't know the units, seeing the decimal for this, there's really no point. Yeah, this is the radius. Okay. Oh, so this is the radius. So that's part. So that's part of the answer. Right, and then we have to do. We have to turn that into liters, right? So I asked, what dimension use the least material? Well, I know the liters. Right, but how many inches is a liter? How many centimeters? That's not relevant to this. So the question is, what dimensions use the least material? Right, but we ensured that right here. Oh. So I know the volume. Okay. Unless I screwed up somewhere else. So I know the volume. Uh, so the one is the liter. The, and the other dimension, yes. The other dimension I need is the height. Okay. So we got the radius. To finish this can, we need the height. How do I get the height? Somewhere around here we had height. Height equals one over pi r squared. So we're going to use that right there. And very carefully plug in this R value. 1 over pi times, oh, this is very ugly, cube root 1 over 2 pi. That's good enough. We'll leave it like that. Oh. Square. There we go.